So thank you everyone for joining this presentation. Uh, just a few quick words uh, about myself. Uh, I am uh, Marco Vigato, I'm an author, researcher, and explorer. I have spent uh, the last uh, 15 years investigating the question of uh, the origins of civilization, visiting hundreds of archeological sites uh, around the world. I'm also the author of the book, The Empires of Atlantis, uh, published by Inner Traditions, in which I present a radically new theory of the origins and the development of civilization focuses on the worldwide diffusion of uh, megalithic monuments. I also uh, founded uh, in 2020 a research association called the Arts Project uh, dedicated to uh, uncovering more of the evidence for ancient advanced civilizations on our planet. Now, the presentation that uh, I'm going to deliver today is largely based on uh, my last book uh, called uh, The Empires of Atlantis. Uh, uh, the book itself is available across all major bookstores uh, in the US and internationally, and also online uh, as, a, 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 as a soft cover book, uh, and uh, also as a Kindle electronic book uh, and uh, in audible format. So the way I've been thinking about uh, structuring this presentation is uh, along uh, five main sections. So we're going to start uh, with uh, the myths. Uh, so going back to the origins of uh, the Atlantis myth uh, and the Atlantis story. Then in part two, we're going to talk about the uh, various historical traditions and traditionalist cosmologies, as well as they relate uh, to uh, different cycles of time and cycles of civilization. In part three, we're going to talk about about uh, some of the evidence and the relics uh, uh, that support the idea of a lost advanced civilization of prehistoric antiquity. Whereas in part four, uh, I will provide an outline of the key elements of Atlantean history and geography. Finally, in uh, the fifth uh, and last uh, section, uh, I will be talking about the legacy of Atlantean civilization and possibility of the survival of certain elements of the Atlantean tradition in various uh, esoteric uh, traditions and the teachings of uh, uh, mystery schools around the world. So starting off uh, with uh, the myths, uh, uh, many of you will certainly be familiar with uh, Plato's uh, Atlantis uh, story. Plato wrote uh, in uh, the 4th century BC, and he's probably the most famous and certainly well-known source on Atlantis, uh, even though, uh, as we we'll also see later, is by no means the only one, nor even the uh, oldest and most ancient source in Atlantis. Plato himself never made a mystery of the fact that he inherited uh, the uh, Atlantis account from his great-grandfather Solon that the origins of uh, the story of Atlantis itself were Egyptians. There are some uh, important elements uh, in Plato's account that we also find in other mythical and historical traditions around the world. The first one is the idea of a recurring cataclysm, meaning that uh, even though Atlantis uh, or the cataclysm that caused the destruction of of Atlantis is uh, probably the uh, latest uh, in order of time to have befallen civilization on our planet. It's by no means the only one. There were previous cataclysms, previous cycles of civilization before Atlantis. Uh, Plato is also at the origin of uh, the idea of a sunken mid-Atlantic uh, landmass or continent. He actually situated Atlantis beyond uh, the Pillars of Hercules and describes it as a very sizable landmass uh, equal in size uh, to the combined extent of Libya or North Africa and Asia Minor together. He also talks about Atlantis as a great colonial empire that established colonies in various parts of the world, uh, both on what he calls the continent beyond, by which we may understand the American continent, as well as uh, in the old world, in Egypt and in Europe, uh, as far as Tyrrhenia or Italy. Another very important element uh, of Plato's account that we find in many other mythical and esoteric traditions is the idea that uh, the Atlanteans were in fact a human divine hybrids. They possess both a divine nature and a human nature. And uh, the cause uh, uh, of the downfall of Atlantis ultimately had to do with uh, 
the prevalence of the human nature. It was ultimately a fall into materialism and the loss of uh, the spiritual origins of uh, uh, the original uh, divine inhabitants. Uh, Plato also provides a specific time frame uh, for the fall and destruction of Atlantis, uh, which he says occurred 9,000 years before the time of Solon, which would uh, situate it around 11,600 years ago. And as we will see, this is a very significant time frame, which just so happens to coincide with uh, uh, a time of great terrestrial upheavals, which geologists and scientists know as uh, the Younger Dryas. Um, of course, uh, Plato himself uh, mentioned uh, that the source of his Atlantis story was originally Egyptian. So if we look at the records of Egypt, uh, that's where we find uh, what are possibly the earliest uh, descriptions of uh, Atlantis, or at least uh, an account uh, very similar in many respects uh, to Plato's Atlantis story. Uh, what is portrayed here is a set of hieroglyphic texts uh, from the Temple of Edfu in Upper Egypt that tell the story of how the primeval island of the gods was destroyed uh, in uh, what appears to have been a cosmic cataclysm caused by an enemy described as uh, a snake, after which uh, survivors uh, from uh, that lost primeval homeland resettled in different parts of the world, uh, eventually colonizing Egypt uh, and uh, setting up the bases and the foundations of dynastic uh, Egyptian civilization. Uh, there are also very similar myths uh, across uh, the Atlantic. Uh, here are some images uh, from uh, a site called Xochicalco, located just south of uh, Mexico City in uh, central Mexico. Uh, there we find a very remarkable structure. It's a pyramid built of huge uh, basalt uh, stone blocks that appear to tell a story very similar to that of uh, Plato's Atlantis and of the Edfu building texts. It's also the story of uh, a land identified as the primeval land of the gods, the homeland of uh, the god Quetzalcoatl, that is destroyed uh, by an enemy, which interestingly is also described here as a snake, which we may take as a symbol or as a representation of a comet or some other uh, cosmic uh, uh, phenomenon that causes the destruction and the sinking of this island, which is here represented in the form of a flaming temple on top uh, of uh, an island uh, itself uh, containing uh, a glyphic name uh, which may in be interpreted as nine wind or nine eye of reptile. There's also a representation of the god Quetzalcoatl uh, uh, which uh, can be seen fleeing from uh, the primeval island uh, as it sinks uh, uh, in the ocean on board of a raft of snakes. Whereas uh, the rest of the bas reliefs uh, seem to refer to the foundations of the gods, so meaning cities and other settlements were founded by Quetzalcoatl and his companions upon their arrival in Mexico. Now, something curious about uh, these uh, different myths uh, from across the Atlantic is the fact that they seem to point to a same location for the primeval homeland of the gods. Uh, so we have myths in Egypt and from Greece uh, that talk about uh, a primeval island located, uh, uh, in this case, uh, to the west of uh, Europe and uh, North Africa in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. But we also find very similar myths uh, across the Atlantic in the New World, in Mexico, Central America, and South America, that uh, uh, talk about, uh, talk in very similar terms uh, about uh, a primeval land that uh, sunk uh, this time to the east of uh, North America. So both sets of myth seem to uh, refer to the same cataclysm, to the same uh, location for which civilization spread to both the old and the new world. Even the Bible uh, seems to preserve uh, the memory of a cataclysm that is uh, very similar uh, to a Plato's description of the fall of Atlantis. We have examples of that both in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, many will be uh, familiar with uh, the description of the fall of the great Babylon in the book of Revelation, which in many respects appears to have been modeled on uh, Plato's description of the fall of Atlantis. 
Atlantis. Uh, Babylon is described as a city sitting upon many waters uh, whose downfall is brought about by a star from heaven. Again, a very close parallel with Plato's uh, uh, description of uh, um, a celestial cataclysm as uh, the cause of the sinking and of the destruction of Atlantis. But we even have... Uh, uh, very similar descriptions uh, to uh, Plato's Atlantis in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Ezekiel, um, and, uh, around the prophecy of uh, the destruction of Tyre. Now, something interesting about the book of Ezekiel is that it was composed in the 6th century BC, so it represents a, a pre-Platonic writing, an independent account of what appears to be a, a cataclysm. In this case, uh, the uh, narration is... Uh, uh, um, takes the form of a prophecy of uh, the destruction of the fall of the Phoenician city of Tyre. But at the same time, there are many references to what appears to have been an earlier cataclysm and to the fact that Tyre will follow the same fate as uh, an unnamed uh, land or civilization that appears to have been destroyed in uh, remote antiquity. And once again, in terms of very similar to uh, Plato's Atlantis. Now, if we also analyze uh, the worldwide diffusion and distribution of uh, flood stories, uh, what we find is uh, over 200 uh, separate and independent accounts uh, around the world. They talk about uh, a global cataclysm that uh, occurred in remote antiquity and that was uh, responsible for the near complete destruction of mankind. Once again, many will be familiar with uh, Noah's story uh, from uh, the Bible, but this is only one of uh, literally hundreds of similar accounts uh, from uh, around the world. The details of these accounts uh, differ in the sense that some talk about uh, a global flood, some others uh, talk about the rain of fire, for instance, or some other cataclysms, including a deep freeze or, or a glaciation, uh, which all appear to have uh, uh, been uh, uh, different phenomena associated with uh, the events of the end of the last ice age, whereas uh, civilizations and peoples living in different parts of the world would have witnessed uh, different types of uh, phenomena and the effects of climate change in different ways. Uh, a fact uh, that's been confirmed by science is that uh, since the end of uh, the last ice age, uh, approximately 11,000 uh, years ago, global sea levels rose uh, by as much as 122 meters or over 400 feet. What you can see here on this chart on the left-hand side in, uh, in red is uh, uh, a representation of the lands uh, that were previously above water during the last glacial maximum approximately 15,000 years ago and have since uh, become submerged. Uh, just to give you a sense of uh, uh, the size uh, and the area of those lands uh, that uh, were lost uh, since the end of the last ice age. We're talking about a combined uh, extension equal to the whole of Europe and China combined or the whole continental USA and South America. So we're really talking about a really uh, an extremely uh, vast uh, portion of land uh, that became submerged. And uh, if we also look at the distribution of those lands, we're probably talking about some of the most uh, fertile lands in the world at the time, exactly where you would expect and imagine to find uh, the center of uh, an ancient advanced uh, civilization. Now, as we move on uh, into the next uh, uh, section, we're going to talk more about uh, some of the historical traditions about Atlantis and this idea of uh, cyclical time that underlies uh, so many of uh, uh, the mythical traditions, uh, not only about Atlantis, but truly about the previous cycles of uh, civilization. Here is uh, what you consider to be a, a truly beautiful and remarkable set of paintings uh, by Thomas Cole that I think very well portrays is, uh, this idea of cycles of civilization, in which uh, um, a civilization is born out of a, a savage or pastoral stage, uh, then rises uh, to great uh, heights of power and splendor. And then you have the fall, the collapse of civilization, after which, uh, as Plato says, uh, civilization in humanity has to start over again uh, as children, so the new cycle of uh, civilization begins. 
Now, many of us uh, will be very familiar with uh, a linear view of uh, time, on, of the uh, timeline of history, in which uh, we tend to see uh, the whole course of uh, human history and evolution on our planet as essentially a linear process in which uh, we go from more primitive forms of society and organization towards more complex and sophisticated ones. So this is a vision that is deeply rooted in evolutionary theory is also largely based on uh, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, this idea of a uniform narrative going from uh, creation towards ultimate salvation. This is, uh, however, very different uh, from ancient uh, worldviews and ancient cosmologies that were instead based on a concept of a cyclical time and multiple cycles of uh, creation. At the origin of uh, many of these views and traditions is uh, probably uh, the cycle of uh, precession, uh, uh, which uh, uh, causes uh, the sun to rise uh, in a different constellation over intervals of uh, several thousand years. Now, the precessional cycle is uh, uh, taken to last uh, for over 25,920 years. That's the time that uh, it takes uh, for a full cycle and so for the sun to rise, to rise again uh, against uh, the same uh, uh, astronomic uh, background. And uh, the, the, the processional cycle is conventionally divided into 12 uh, processional hours represented by uh, different zodiacal constellations. There also some very important numbers that uh, we'll find uh, appear very often in uh, ancient myths, uh, ancient traditions related uh, to uh, previous cycles of civilization, which all appear to be multiples of uh, the number 12. Uh, some of these uh, are very significant numbers as they relate to the processional cycles and, uh, as I said, also to different cycles of uh, civilization. There are also a number of different hypotheses that have been formulated concerning how the processional cycle, far from being just an astronomical phenomenon caused by uh, a wobble in the Earth's axis, uh, may actually uh, be uh, related uh, to um, some broader cosmic uh, causes. Uh, one model in this sense uh, is uh, the one that suggests that the ultimate cause of a precession is not this wobble in the Earth's axis, but rather the fact that the Earth and the whole solar system is in fact uh, uh, orbiting uh, or is part of a binary system with uh, another star, uh, very likely the star uh, Sirius, uh, and that these uh, may in fact account uh, uh, not only for precession, but also for the shifts uh, in uh, consciousness uh, and uh, in, ter in the terrestrial medium in general that seem to accompany the transition from one precessional or cosmological age uh, to another. As we analyze uh, some of the earliest uh, traditions uh, about uh, different cycles of time and cycles of civilization, probably the most uh, famous and well-known one is the Hindu tradition of uh, the yugas uh, that seems to have inspired also uh, the Greek idea of different ages of men in this division of human history into a golden age, a silver age, a bronze age, uh, and uh, iron age. Several attempts uh, have been made uh, to reconcile the Hindu uh, yuga system and this idea of different ages of men with uh, the processional cycle, um, starting uh, in antiquity and uh, as recently as uh, the 1970s uh, when René Guénon proposed uh, um, his model of uh, uh, different cycles uh, of time uh, and uh, uh, successfully managed to reconcile also the length and duration of uh, the different ages with uh, the uh, processional cycle. Now, why is this important? Uh, because uh, with knowledge of uh, the length and duration of uh, the different uh, ages, it is also possible to understand that when uh, certain transition points occurred uh, throughout the course of human history, and also, therefore, to understand uh, better the ancient myths and tradition uh, that talk about 
about uh, previous cycles of uh, civilization and when the uh, last uh, transitions or the last terrestrial cataclysms may have occurred. It has become possible also to situate uh, in time the last Atlantean cataclysm that caused the uh, destruction, the final sinking of Atlantis in 10,961 BCE. It has 7,200 years before the year 720 of the Kali Yuga, according to the chronology of uh, René Guénon. Now, a very similar concept, a very similar model is also found in uh, Mesoamerica. This is uh, the famous legend of the suns uh, as uh, portrayed uh, on the Aztec calendar or the Aztec sandstone. Uh, this is again based on uh, a division of uh, time and of the course of human history in, uh, in this case, in five different epochs, uh, of which four are already past, represented uh, by uh, the previous suns. And uh, one is uh, the current one uh, under the present sun uh, that, uh, again, uh, is expected uh, to end uh, in cataclysm. Uh, something interesting about this model is uh, uh, not only the sequence of uh, different uh, world ages uh, to which the Mesoamerican tradition also assigns very long uh, durations of time in the order of several uh, thousands of years for a total of over 20,000 years uh, in a full cycle. There's also this idea that at the end of each world age or each sun, a cataclysm occurs so that a new cycle of civilization, a new cycle of life on Earth can begin. Now, if we uh, then move on to uh, Mesopotamia, that's where we uh, where we find uh, the first uh, written uh, records of uh, humanity, uh, the cuneiform texts and tablets of uh, Mesopotamia uh, are some of the earliest uh, written documents of uh, mankind. It's certainly interesting to observe how uh, a large number of these documents and tablets also deal with various historical and mythical chronologies. Um, a great a great uh, deal of attention was put up by uh, scribes and historians during the Sumerian and Babylonian period in reconstructing uh, the history and the sequence of dynasties that ruled over Mesopotamia in the pre-Diluvian and post-Diluvian period. And that's uh, how several different kings lists uh, have uh, survived uh, down to the present day. Uh, the most famous one are the king list of Barassus that was compiled in the 3rd century uh, BC, uh, certainly uh, relying on much earlier sources, such as uh, various uh, uh, Sumerian kings list, uh, which uh, we have uh, several examples that include here the well blundered prism uh, dated to uh, 1800 uh, uh, BC, as well as uh, Nippur Tablet B. These are some of the oldest written documents of uh, mankind. They actually project uh, the origins of a civilization, in this case of Mesopotamian and Sumerian civilization, in very remote antiquity. These documents uh, speak uh, of uh, several dynasties uh, stretching for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years in the pre Diluvian and post diluvian period. Uh, and something interesting in going back to this uh, idea of our relationship between cycles of civilization and the processional cycle is that many of these numbers here appear to be also exact uh, multiples uh, uh, of uh, the processional cycle. We have here, for instance, the total given by Barassus for the Antediluvian dynasties of 432,000 uh, years, which is, again, a significant uh, processional number. And then uh, you also have uh, uh, several of uh, the lengths of reign attributed uh, to the different kings that seem to have a direct relationship with uh, the uh, processional 
processional cycle. Another important element that we can derive from uh, these uh, uh, lists uh, is uh, uh, the data for the Great Flood, or at least uh, the first cataclysm, uh, as we'll see later, or what uh, I will later refer to as the first Atlantean cataclysm, that uh, Barossus uh, dates uh, to the year 34,654 BCE. Similar king's lists have also been found in Egypt. Uh, here are uh, some of the most uh, important ones so that included the Turin king list, uh, the list of Maneto, but there are several other ones that contain different fragments of Egyptian uh, chronologies uh, and uh, king's list. Probably one of the most famous sources uh, for our understanding or reconstruction of the different sequence of uh, Egyptian dynasties and kings is uh, the Turin King list. Uh, the Turin King list contains uh, on one side uh, of uh, the papyrus uh, a list of the historical kings of Egypt that reigned uh, beginning with the King Menes uh, in 3100 BCE. But then the other side of uh, the papyrus uh, contains uh, a list uh, of uh, the uh, semi-divine kings that ruled over Egypt in prehistoric times. Uh, once again, uh, adding up to very remarkable totals uh, in terms of numbers of years uh, of over 30,000 years. So going back to pretty much the same uh, time period as uh, the other Sumerian and Babylonian kings lists. Now, uh, all of these uh, uh, also uh, finds uh, um, a reflection in various esoteric cosmologies. Um, of course, in the system of uh, theosophy and many uh, traditionalist schools, uh, there is uh, this idea of uh, several different previous cycles of uh, civilization or root races of uh, humanity preceding uh, uh, our own, so that the present humanity is uh, in fact uh, uh, or does in fact represent the fifth uh, cycle of civilization on earth against against something that finds a parallel in uh, the Mesoamerican legend of the sun as well as uh, in the Hindu doctrine of the yuga cycle and many other uh, historical mythical traditions from around the world that talk about different cycles of civilization ending in cataclysm now in the system of uh, theosophy there are actually seven road races in the present uh, cycle, uh, of which uh, the present humanity represents uh, the fifth uh, or Aryan humanity, with two more road races, the sixth uh, and the seventh, that have not yet appeared. In this uh, uh, system, uh, the Atlantean road race represents the fourth uh, uh, road race, uh, being the one immediately uh, before our own. Something also interesting uh, in uh, this uh, uh, system of esoteric cosmology is the fact uh, that uh, the first uh, appearance of life or civilization on Earth is attributed to the incarnation or manifestation of uh, some uh, spiritual beings or entities on the physical plane, with the uh, beginning of the polar and hyperborean races as uh, some uh, still uh, largely ethereal and immaterial races. This is something thing uh, that uh, uh, we find uh, also in Plato's account of Atlantis when he talks about the divine origins of uh, the Atlanteans as a resulting uh, from what uh, we may in fact consider to be the incarnation of a divine principle represented by the god Poseidon in uh, a human and material body uh, of, uh, of, of Cleto. So this is, uh, again, a foundational element uh, of uh, many world traditions and mythologies, this idea that uh, uh, at the origin of uh, human civilization is really the incarnation or the manifestation on the physical plane of some higher spiritual beings. Now, uh, something uh, interesting happens when we uh, compare these different traditions of uh, cycles of time and the chronologies uh, provided by various of the esoteric and mythical traditions uh, with uh, uh, the timeline of uh, human history. Now, if we uh, assume and we take as a, a reference date uh, that of the uh, sinking of Atlantis at uh, the time of the second Atlantean cataclysm around the 13th 
10,000 years ago or in 10,961 BC, according to Ganon's chronology, as uh, the peak of uh, the last golden age. What we find is that we are right now coming out of uh, the Iron Age, just beginning the slow ascending path into a new golden age, something which is, again, consistent with Hindu uh, mythology. And if we go back uh, one full cycle uh, of uh, 25,920 years, so one full processional cycle in order to get to the previous Golden Age, that's when we find the first Atlantean cataclysm. We go back to a time around 36,000 years BCE, which is very close to the date provided by Berossus, for instance, and by several Sumerian and Babylonian account for the first flood. So it's actually possible to uh, overlap these uh, different uh, chronologies and mythical traditions uh, from around the world uh, with different uh, cycles of time based on uh, procession. So we will then explore later on throughout the course of the presentation is how the cycle of Atlantean humanity then maps uh, on uh, these uh, broader cycles of civilization and life on Earth, and also how it intersects uh, with the cycle of the present uh, Aryan humanity. Uh, this is, again, a division that uh, we will refer back to in the rest of the presentation, particularly as we talk about the different periods of uh, Atlantean history. But we can roughly divide uh, the course of Atlantean civilization into five main periods. We have the first Atlantean period that goes uh, from uh, the first uh, appearance of anatomically modern humans on Atlantis, very well over half a million years ago, down to the first Atlantean Atlantean cataclysm in uh, 36,000 uh, BCE. And there is then a dark age of following uh, that first Atlantean cataclysm and until the foundation of uh, the second Atlantean empire about 24,000 years BCE, uh, which lasted until the second Atlantean cataclysm in 10,961 BCE, once again, according to Genon's chronology, after which we have a period of around 39 years, leading us to 9600 BCE, which is the date provided by Plato for the final destruction and sinking of Atlantis. And this period we will refer to as a Neo-Atlantean period, after which we enter into what may be called the post Atlantean period, which lasts uh, uh, probably until the late uh, European Bronze Age, with, with uh, the last remnants uh, and vestiges of uh, Atlantean civilization. In parallel, we also have the cycle of uh, Aryan humanity, whereas uh, according to esoteric tradition, uh, this uh, Aryan cycle began at the time of the first Atlantean cataclysm, the first destruction of Atlantis centered in uh, Central Asia and the region of the Gobi Desert. And we also see uh, the rise and the appearance of an atlanto aryan civilization resulting from the fusion of uh, the original Atlantean element with the new uh, Aryan element in the aftermath of the second Atlantean cataclysm and throughout the Neo-Atlantean and the post-Atlantean period. Now, a very important question has to do with uh, the origin of uh, uh, anatomically modern humans. Uh, there is uh, the possibility that uh, Atlantean civilization, uh, uh, far from being only an episode or a civilization, a culture in the history of humanity, may have actually represented a rather separate human species uh, that at some point uh, interbred with other hominin species to give rise to anatomically modern humans. This is something that is reflected across a number of world mythologies and traditions, starting with the biblical account of the Nephilim, this idea that the sons of God went into the daughters of men and began a progeny, a hybrid progeny from them, but also goes back to the roots of Plato's Atlantis story and this idea idea of uh, the Atlanteans or the first Atlantean kings as being the progeny of a god, uh, Poseidon, and of a mortal woman, Cleto. Uh, there is also uh, what could be 
potentially genetic evidence of uh, these uh, admixture of a yet unknown uh, human species uh, at some point in the uh, human evolutionary tree in the form of uh, the worldwide diffusion of the so-called haplogroup X and the Rh negative uh, blood type of which appear to be very curiously distributed on both sides of the Atlantic as if uh, both originated from a now lost uh, sunken mid-Atlantic continent. So we then move on uh, into the next section. Uh, here we're going to talk about uh, some of the relics and the vestiges uh, of uh, Atlantean civilization. So uh, if we're talking about uh, several different uh, historical and mythical traditions about Atlantis, we're now going to talk about what is uh, some of the evidence uh, of uh, the former existence of uh, an ancient advanced civilization of uh, prehistoric antiquity. And uh, we will start uh, by looking at uh, the possibility of uh, the former existence of a now sunken mid-Atlantic landmass similar to uh, Plato's Atlantis. Now, if we take uh, a chart of uh, the Atlantic Ocean uh, seafloor, something that truly uh, striking is the presence of a huge uh, uh, submarine mountain chain, which is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, that pretty much uh, crosses uh, uh, from uh, pole to pole, it extends uh, uh, from the North Pole then to the South Pole, roughly in uh, the middle of uh, this huge uh, geological depression, which is uh, the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ocean, and pretty much centered on uh, the Azores Plateau. If we were to imagine uh, the uh, Mid-Atlantic ridge uh, above water to drain the whole Atlantic uh, Ocean basin of uh, its water, what we would see is a mountain chain uh, with a combined length greater than that of the Rocky Mountains of North America and the Andes of South America, and with heights comparable to the Himalayas, uh, raising for over 8,900 meters from the ocean seafloor. Uh, some of the highest peaks of these submerged mountain chain still emerge today above water and form the islands of the Azores, Madeiras, uh, Iceland, Land, as well as uh, some of the other uh, Atlantic uh, islands. There is uh, also evidence that has been uncovered over the last uh, uh, few decades uh, of uh, the former subaerial existence of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, meaning that at some point in the recent uh, geological past, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, was uh, above water. And so many uh, portions of this mighty mountain chain that is uh, currently uh, submerged uh, underwater existed as uh, a sizable land mass above water, mostly in the region of uh, the Azores archipelago, which also happens to be uh, the most likely location uh, provided by Plato for Atlantis. Uh, the geological evidence for the former subaerial existence of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge includes lava formations that could only have formed under subaerial conditions in the open air, which have been found at depths exceeding 3,000 meters on uh, the Atlantic seafloor. Also includes uh, the presence of uh, a variety of uh, fossil organisms that include shallow water corals, uh, algae, and the atome that have been found at depths exceeding in 2,500 meters uh, and uh, have been dated uh, to the recent geological past. So we were talking about some of these uh, geological evidence. We talk about evidence that was formed within uh, the last tens of thousands of years, so well within uh, the uh, historical time frame when the human beings already existed on our planet. There's also evidence uh, in the form of uh, terracing uh, along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that seems to suggest that uh, the sinking of the ridge itself occurred through different episodes, uh, some of which uh, would have been relatively gradual, but uh, with also some truly cataclysmic episodes of sinking of uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. 
what you can see on the right hand side uh, um, is a model of uh, the uh, sinking of the mid atlantic ridge uh, the ridge itself is mostly based is mostly uh, composed of basalt uh, stones and so as uh, magma as molten rock is ejected from the depths of the earth it pushes up these uh, uh, mountain chain that would emerge as an island but then as uh, the lava cools down that causes the sinking of the ridge and the fracturing of uh, the tectonic plates uh, around uh, the ridge itself. Uh, this uh, is uh, probably the most likely cause of the terracing uh, that we can witness at different uh, depths uh, along the mid-Atlantic ridge uh, that seems to uh, refer to uh, periods of cataclysmic sinking of the ridge itself, uh, during which uh, these uh, now sunken mountain chain sunk by several hundred meters uh, at a time or within uh, what we may consider as virtual geological instant. And of course, uh, these uh, uh, great geological instability in the region of the Mid-Atlantic region may have been uh, exacerbated and accentuated by external factors, as we'll see, such as uh, the possibility of a cosmic impact or a cometary impact at the end uh, of uh, the last ice age. There's also a significant evidence uh, in the form of extinct uh, river beds uh, that extend uh, for hundreds of miles off uh, the coast of uh, the Azores, particularly of São Miguel Island in the Azores, uh, that suggests that uh, a very sizable landmass uh, actually became submerged in the recent geological past around the Azores, pretty much in the same location where Plato and several other mythical and esoteric traditions situate the lost continent or island of Atlantis. Now, something closely related to the possible former existence of a landmass in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, of a now sunken landmass in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, is offered by several ancient maps and charts that seem to contain hints of pre-glacial topography. Many will have heard about the famous Piri Race map of 1513 that appears to depict the coastal profiles of South America as well as of uh, Antarctica at a time when these lands uh, had not yet been discovered or explored. Uh, and the, uh, the admiral himself, the author of uh, this chart, um, actually uh, suggests or seems to suggest in his theories that the source uh, uh, from which he compiled the map was actually a set of uh, far older maps probably dating back to Hellenistic times the originated uh, originating from the now lost uh, library of Alexandria as if to suggest that what we're seeing is in fact a relic or a legacy from a much older cartographic tradition. We then have uh, the example of uh, the truly remarkable Portland charts that uh, appeared in Europe in uh, the Middle Ages. These uh, represented uh, um, a huge uh, change, uh, um, a truly dramatic shift uh, from earlier forms of medieval cartography. Uh, these are not only extremely accurate uh, maps uh, that correctly um, report the latitude and longitude of different ports and coastal features, but also the level of accuracy in the representation and the depiction of the various coastlines and the projection techniques appear to have been far in advance of anything available at the time. One of the most important studies on the origin of Portland charts was made by Royal Nicolai in 2016, in which he actually suggests a pre-medieval origin of these charts, which may have originated in very remote antiquity. Uh, something uh, that is worth mentioning is that many of these maps uh, seem to contain hints uh, at the pre-glacial topography, meaning that the profile of uh, the coastlines of the lands depicted 
data on this chart does not seem to match the uh, coastlines and sea levels uh, as uh, they were during uh, the Middle Ages when these maps were allegedly drawn or compiled, but uh, uh, seems to show uh, what uh, the uh, coastlines of Europe and the various different lands, including South America and Antarctica, even in the case of the Piero Reis map, would have looked like during the last glacial maximum, so that these maps may in fact be copies of uh, far earlier maps whose originals may date back back to the time of the last ice age. Another great example that you can see here on the right hand side is uh, the Zeno map of the north. Uh, that's a, a map that was originally compiled in uh, Venice uh, over 700 years ago, and it depicts uh, the northern uh, Atlantic islands, uh, including Greenland and Iceland. What is interesting is that these maps also show a number of phantom islands uh, that are given the names of Friesland, uh, Estland, Icaria, for instance which, uh, uh, of course, uh, no longer exist, uh, but uh, uh, seem to coincide with the location of uh, submerged sea mounds uh, or submerged plateaus. As in the case of the Rocco Plateau, uh, the Far Or Plateau is much more uh, extensive uh, than it is uh, today. So that if you overlap uh, this uh, map of the north uh, drawn in the 14th century with a bathymetric uh, seafloor chart of the North Atlantic Ocean, you find an almost perfect correspondence between these uh, phantom islands with known underwater fissures uh, that were certainly above water at the time of the last glacial maximum. As if to suggest that once again, that whatever original sources these maps were based on, they actually contained elements of pre-glacial topography. Uh, in that, uh, uh, that's suggesting uh, the possibility that uh, either these maps were based on originals dating back to a lost civilization or of the last ice age, or that uh, the sinking of uh, these uh, uh, Atlantic lands and the islands is actually a relatively recent phenomenon that may have occurred uh, probably within the last uh, couple of thousand years. Now, as we uh, think about uh, what could be the most uh, likely cause of uh, the sinking and uh, destruction of Atlantis, Plato himself in his uh, Atlantis uh, dialogues talk about, talks about uh, a certain deviation of the cosmic bodies moving in space around the Earth as uh, the cause for the sinking and the destruction of Atlantis, which once again is situates in time around uh, 9600 BC. Now, it so happens uh, that uh, just around the same time uh, when Plato situates uh, the sinking and destruction of Atlantis, a truly remarkable event uh, in the Earth geological history occurred, which is uh, known as uh, the Younger Dryas. This is uh, a very mysterious, still largely unexplained, cold spell, which lasted around uh, 1,500 years, uh, um, about the time of uh, the end of the last ice age, which again plunged uh, our planet into uh, a deep freeze, uh, into what appears to have been a short uh, ice age of uh, limited duration, that then also ended uh, quite abruptly uh, just around 9,600 years uh, BCE. Now, uh, Lots of uh, theories uh, have been uh, presented in order to explain uh, these uh, anomaly. And uh, one of the theories that have gained the most traction in recent years is that of a cosmic impact at uh, the beginning and also at the end of uh, the Younger Dryas. This is a model proposed by uh, such researchers as uh, Firestone, Kenneth, uh, and West that have suggested that the giant fragmented comet may have impacted our planet around 13,000 years ago. So so also around the time of uh, the uh, Atlantean cataclysm, or the final Atlantean cataclysm, according to many esoteric traditions and uh, world mythologies. And this cometary impact would have been uh, responsible for the near complete extinction of all the Pleistocene megafauna, including the mammoths, uh, and certainly for widespread destruction, devastation on the nearly continental hemispheric scale, particularly in uh, the northern hemisphere. 
Now, there's also the possibility that this cataclysm may have been responsible for the sinking of uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, or at least uh, of those portions of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that were still above water at uh, that time. There's also the evidence for a very sudden and abrupt ending of uh, the Younger Trias, just around 9,600 years BCE, which uh, uh, was accompanied by a sudden rise in uh, uh, sea temperatures and an end of uh, the glaciation over much of Western and the Northern Europe. Now, an interesting explanation of this sudden end of the Younger Trias uh, may have to do with the sinking of the Mid-Atlantic Ridges. It would have been the sinking of this uh, uh, barrier, of this mountain barrier in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean that would have allowed for the first time the warm Gulf Stream to reach uh, the coasts of uh, uh, Western and Northern Europe, thus affect the ending the ice age over much of the continent and thus explain the sudden rise in sea and air temperature that is witnessed after the end of uh, the Younger Dryas. Something uh, uh, quite uh, uh, unexplained uh, and that uh, uh, scientists, historians have struggled for decades to explain is how after immediately after the end of uh, the last ice age, we witness a sudden explosion of culture and civilization accompanying the so-called agricultural revolution. And that's the time when uh, uh, different types of cereals, crops, plants, and animals have become domesticated. And it's certainly a mystery how this seems to have occurred at pretty much around the same time, just around 10,000, 11,000 years ago in many different parts of the world at the same time. So you have all these different centers of crop domestication that you can see on uh, the map uh, that all seem to have arisen at roughly the same time and in seemingly an independent uh, way. Uh, something also quite uh, unexplained has to do with, with the techniques uh, that uh, uh, were employed in order to domesticate all these different uh, types of crops, of plants and animals, which in some cases uh, may have involved very sophisticated uh, detoxification techniques and even genetic engineering in, uh, in some cases. Um, it's certainly hard to explain these as just a coincidence if one thinks that uh, pretty much all of the edible foodstuffs uh, in terms of uh, plants and crops that form the basis of our diets today were domesticated at that time and that ever since no further episodes of plant or animal domestication have occurred throughout the history of humanity. We also then think about uh, just how strange uh, it is that humanity for tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, essentially lived uh, in uh, the condition of hunter-gatherers. And then all of a sudden, and simultaneously in so many different parts and regions of the world, we have a sudden explosion of civilization uh, with the invention of uh, agriculture, crop and animal domestication, also what appears to be the beginning of a megalithic architecture at such sites as Gobekli Tepe, which have been dated uh, to the centuries uh, immediately following the end of uh, the Younger Dryas. So uh, we can almost make a uh, uh, the suggestion here that uh, what appear to be independent cradles of agriculture may turn out uh, not to be uh, exactly independent, but rather the result of uh, a colonization or of a scattering of survivors from a lost civilization of prehistoric antiquity that brought with them uh, the seeds, the plants, the crop and animal, and domesticated animal varieties uh, uh, to all these different lands and also uh, created the, for the first uh, forms of stable and permanent social organization in these lands that they conquered and decolonized. Um, something uh, that we find uh, pretty much all over the world is this uh, idea that uh, civilization and agriculture in particular appeared as a gift of the gods. So, so never we're told that uh, agriculture or the arts of civilization were developed uh, through chance experimentation or through trial and error, but all of these uh, great inventions and innovation seem to have uh, arisen as if uh, out of nowhere. And uh, uh, what we find in these different 
different mythical traditions this idea that these were essentially a legacy, an inheritance from the gods, that uh, the gods taught uh, primitive humanity all the arts of civilization, including agriculture, astronomy, the art of building in stone, uh, monumental architecture, mathematics, geometry. This is something we find both in the old world and the new world. In the new world, we have uh, many myths uh, about uh, Quetzalcoatl, Viracocha, Tunupa, Kukulkan, the various civilizing gods are almost invariably said to have come from the east to Mesoamerica and have then taught the primitive inhabitants uh, the arts of civilization. But also across the Atlantic in the old world in Mesopotamia, we have the story of Oannes, for instance, the taught uh, primitive mankind, uh, the arts of civilization, and the, in the testimony of the Babylonian historian Barasso, so universal where these uh, instruction and nothing has been added uh, uh, since the time of uh, the gods, uh, since the time these uh, great culture heroes and uh, civilizing gods came and imparted their teachings to primitive mankind. Uh, something closely associated uh, with uh, these uh, different myths uh, about the origin of agriculture and these different cradles of agriculture is also the worldwide diffusion of a megalithic architecture. There are literally hundreds of megalithic sites around the world that show pretty remarkable engineering and construction techniques so based on the use of extremely large uh, blocks of stone that also appear to have been almost uh, perfectly jointed and fitted together. You can find here many examples from Peru, South America, uh, Egypt, uh, as far as uh, Israel, the Middle East, uh, uh, Italy, and, uh, and Mexico, that uh, even with uh, um, the respective differences uh, seem nevertheless to, um, to have used uh, the same uh, system of uh, proportion, the same canons of uh, megalithic architecture. Many of these sites are of unknown dating, uh, so that uh, the dating of uh, these uh, constructions is still a matter of, uh, of debate, uh, but some of these sites may very well date back uh, to the same uh, time period uh, after the end of the last ice age, when uh, at Atlantean survivors and refugees uh, colonized the lands uh, both to the east uh, and uh, west uh, of uh, the Atlantic Ocean and established the civilizations modeled after the Atlantean homeland. Uh, there is uh, then, of course, the worldwide uh, diffusion of uh, pyramids. Uh, we find the pyramids uh, pretty much all over the world. Uh, and uh, what is remarkable is the similarity in architecture that we find uh, across monuments as far apart as uh, Cambodia, uh, Egypt, uh, Central America, South America, and also the uh, symbolic associations that surround these monuments as a representation of uh, the primeval mound, uh, the mound of creation, thus suggesting that the archetype of a pyramid construction may be also of uh, Atlantean origin. Uh, talking specifically about uh, the Great Pyramid, uh, this is uh, the structure, it's probably the most mysterious uh, structure on Earth, and uh, the one that uh, uh, many authors uh, have uh, traditionally associated with uh, the idea of a lost uh, advanced civilization of prehistoric antiquity, just because of the size of the structure and its engineering and architectural complexity that seems to have been uh, far beyond uh, the technical and engineering capabilities of uh, the local Egyptian inhabitants. Something uh, important to keep in mind about the Great Pyramid, however, is that it is in fact a composite uh, structure that uh, was probably built uh, over the course of uh, several thousand years uh, and whose construction probably progressed and proceeded in different stages. Something that uh, I also suggest in my book as well as in a uh, of articles they've published on the subject is that construction of the Great Pyramid may have started in the Neo-Atlantean period, so immediately after the uh, Atlantean cataclysm uh, and the uh, beginning of uh, the Younger Dryas, uh, and then construction stopped. Uh, 
right around 9600 BCE with the sinking of uh, Atlantis and the final collapse of Atlantean civilization, only to be resumed in a much simpler and a much cruder form thousands of years later, as also evidenced by the difference in the style of construction, the accuracy of uh, the masonry of uh, the Great Pyramid. Another very important uh, uh, hint uh, at uh, the possible existence of a yet uh, known lost civilization of prehistoric antiquity is uh, the worldwide diffusion of uh, various uh, metric systems that uh, seem to have uh, originated with uh, a common source of a very remote uh, antiquity. Now, if you think about how many of our modern units of measure, including the meter, came to be, they were essentially defined as a fraction of uh, uh, the fundamental dimensions of the Earth, of our planet. So the meter was defined in 1793 as uh, the 10 millionth part of the arc distance between the equator and the North Pole. However, the uh, measurement uh, uh, instrument and tools available at the time did not allow yet for an absolutely precise uh, measurement of the Earth's circumference, which in fact resulted in an error of 0.02%, uh, which, however small, still equals to over 15 kilometers over the entire Earth's circumference. Now, if we go back to some of the um, ancient uh, units of measurement, uh, it's certainly interesting to find uh, the meter in many ancient sites, like at Tiwanaku in Bolivia. We find uh, many uh, structures, uh, many stone blocks that uh, um, appear to have been uh, measured in meters or whose basic dimensions yield exact figures when uh, measured in uh, meters. But there is also then the question of uh, several ancient units of measurement, uh, like uh, the Roman futa, the sacred cubit, for instance, the megalithic yard, that also seem to have been defined as exact fractions of the Earth's circumference, so that we may be able to express the polar circumference of the Earth as 135 million Roman feet, 63 million sacred cubits, 129 million 600,000 Greek feet. And these are very exact measurement with an almost negligible margin of error, far superior to uh, the error um, to the error in measurement. Uh, that accompanied uh, the definition of the meter. Another uh, very remarkable uh, observation is the fact that the equatorial circumference of the Earth can also be exactly expressed as 360,000 by 365. Uh, 245 English feet, whereas, of course, 360 is the number of degrees in the circle, whereas 365.242 is the length of the solar year. So that these are ancient units of measurement that seem to have, in fact, linked uh, space uh, and uh, time. Some structures, uh, like the Great Pyramid, appear to have been also designed as exact uh, scale models and representations of the Earth. In the case of the Great Pyramid, it can be demonstrated that the basic dimensions of the Great Pyramid make it uh, an exact uh, scale model of the Northern Hemisphere on a scale of 43,200,000, um, which uh, is uh, once again uh, a very significant uh, processional uh, number. And this is uh, exact uh, to a level of accuracy which is far greater than uh, that of the meter or of many of our modern units of measurement, once again prompting the question as to where exactly this knowledge originated and how it came down to the civilizations of the historical period. Uh, there is also uh, the case uh, for ancient uh, advanced uh, technology in the form of uh, some uh, very mysterious uh, tool marks uh, that are found on stones and at the archaeological sites 
around the world. The evidence uh, includes uh, striations uh, that are compatible with the use of high-speed uh, drills, uh, saws, and even circular saws. Um, of course, uh, we have uh, no direct evidence of these machines that have long disappeared, but what we can see in the form of uh, tool marks uh, on the stone itself is uh, uh, almost certain evidence that these machines uh, existed uh, in remote antiquity in order to produce so the type of uh, striations and the type of, of pull marks that we can observe. One truly really remarkable example you can see here on the left-hand side is that of an almost uh, perfect uh, circular cut uh, on a block of granite from the site of Abu Rawash in Egypt, which is the site of a ruined pyramid, almost contemporary with the Great Pyramid of uh, Giza, uh, that uh, could only have been produced uh, by a rotating cell with the enormous diameter of over 70 meters or over 23 feet, uh, which uh, you can find uh, a representation of reconstruction below, but also many more examples. So you can see in some of the other pictures of uh, drill marks, uh, drill cores uh, drilled in granite or basalt at speeds in some cases uh, as testified by the feed rate and by distance between the different striations uh, uh, and grooves. In some cases, equal or even exceed uh, those of the finest diamond tools of today. And all of these at a time uh, when uh, the best available tools would have been in copper chisels and uh, stone uh, tools. Similar evidence of uh, um, advanced uh, stonework and advanced uh, stone cutting technologies also found in South America, in Peru, in central Mexico, where you have those uh, truly remarkable artifacts made of obsidian, uh, which is a very fragile volcanic glass, which was a uh, uh, worked uh, to within uh, a fraction of a millimeter as to make it uh, almost transparent. Uh, but there are also examples in India where a team from uh, um, the BAM project is currently studying these truly remarkable caves uh, at the site of Barabar that appear to have been cut with a laser-like precision into very hard granite. Some of the evidence for ancient advanced technology actually goes back several thousand years. Uh, you have one example here of a bracelet, what appears to be a bracelet from the site of Asikli Hoyuk in Turkey, which has been uh, dated to 7000 BCE and uh, appears to have been made of obsidian with a level of polish and precision, which, according to the authors of uh, the uh, study, um, is uh, in fact comparable to some of the finest telescope lenses of today. So again, all of these uh, suggest uh, the former existence of uh, advanced forms of technology in uh, remote antiquity, of which a legacy may have survived also well into the uh, historical period. Now, talking about uh, what is uh, probably the ultimate uh, uh, relic, uh, an idea or a concept that it is found in uh, many mythologies throughout the world, is this idea that uh, humanity was essentially created uh, by the gods uh, as a slave species in order to perform the work of the gods. There are many examples of these in the Babylonian epic of Atahasis, for instance, where it is said that mankind uh, was created to carry the burden of the toil of uh, the gods. Uh, there were some very specific descriptions of uh, the process that was followed in order to create uh, the first anatomically modern human by mixing uh, what is described as the divine element uh, with uh, what is probably an hominin element coming from one of the uh, several different hominin species, including Neanderthals or Denisovans, uh, Homo erectus uh, that existed on Earth at the time. Similar accounts are also found uh, in uh, Mesoamerica, like in the Popol Vuh, the sacred book of the Mayas that seems to describe several different creation attempts uh, by the gods before present uh, mankind. Now, something interesting is uh, uh, comparing these uh, mythical traditions with uh, the evidence uh, for the appearance of the first anatomically uh, modern humans, uh, particularly the so-called Cro-Magnon uh, invasions into Europe. Uh, Cro-Magnon men appears very suddenly uh, in different waves. Uh, so scientists have identified at least three major waves of uh, colonization of the European continent. 
continent, uh, each one associated with different uh, stone tool tradition. The first one being called the Origination, starting around 40,000 BCE, then the Solutrian, the Magdalenian, and the uh, Azilian, lasting up until around 10,000 BCE. All these different invasions seem to have followed period of uh, significant geologic instability in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, and they almost invariably appear to have originated from the West, so from the direction of uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Something remarkable about Cro-Magnon men uh, is the fact that these uh, uh, human species uh, or these kind of anatomically modern humans seems to possess, uh, seems to have possessed uh, uh, a brain size uh, between 50 and 80 percent larger than that of other hominins existing at the time, with a, a peculiarly elongated uh, shape of the skull, a strong and powerfully um, built uh, body structure. Most of the individual whose remains have been found in graves uh, dating back to the Aurignacian Solutrian period at heights uh, in excess of uh, six feet. So these would have been veritable giants uh, for, for the time. And all these uh, findings uh, seem in a way to corroborate and match the various mythical accounts of uh, the creation of uh, mankind as if anatomically modern humans were in fact the result of high hybridization between uh, Atlantean men or Homo Atlanticus, which represented in a way the divine portion, and some other hominin species then existing at the time. Right, so in this uh, fourth uh, section, we're actually uh, going to provide some elements of uh, Atlantean history and uh, geography. So that's the section called the Empires of Atlantis, in which we're going to examine the overall course of Atlantean civilization. Something important to keep in mind, uh, particularly for uh, those of you who will be familiar with Plato's Atlantis story, is that even though most of the traditions of Atlantis uh, tend to focus on uh, the downfall and the final destruction, of Atlantis as a point in time episode, certainly this civilization existed for many thousands of years or probably several cycles of uh, Atlantean civilization. This is uh, what I've been trying uh, here to put together and reconstruct in, uh, in this table. So roughly speaking, we can talk about four main periods of Atlantean uh, civilization. Uh, the first Atlantean period that goes from uh, the very first appearance of anatomically modern humans on uh, Earth uh, around half a million years ago, down to the time of uh, the first Atlantean cataclysm. And that's a time when, according to the esoteric tradition, and particularly according to Edgar Cayce, a war started on Atlantis between two different factions, uh, being the Sons of Belial and the Children of the Law of One, which resulted in the fragmentation of Atlantean society, possibly also in uh, some sort of uh, uh, semi-scientific interference with the balance of nature, which ultimately resulted in in the first Atlantean cataclysm. The second Atlantean period uh, then witnesses uh, the birth of the second uh, Atlantean empire around 17,000 years BCE. These uh, also coincides in esoteric uh, chronologies uh, with uh, the beginning of uh, the so-called uh, uh, Silver Age or the Treta Yuga. And uh, in uh, the... Uh, system of different world ages and root races of, uh, of theosophy also coincides with the appearance of Aryan civilization of Aryan humanity in Central Asia from um, an offshoot uh, of uh, Atlantean uh, civilization uh, from the time of the Atlantean uh, civil war. It is also time when we witness a direct confrontation between uh, uh, the uh, Atlantean civilization and the last remnants of Atlantean civilization and the nascent uh, Aryan Empire, uh, which we find uh, descriptions in the Hindu epics of uh, the Mahabharata and uh, the Ramayana. Then after the Younger Dryas uh, Cataclysm, uh, we have uh, what we call the Neo-Atlantean period. Uh, uh, this is uh, a time of global reconstruction in which uh, in the aftermath of the global cataclysm, we, which, uh, we, we witness uh, a surge in construction, in megalithic construction, the birth of agriculture, many advanced forms of civilization and human society organization that appear in different parts of the world as uh, Atlantean refugees 
refugees and survivors uh, uh, colonize and settle into different parts of the world, establishing civilizations modeled after the Atlantean homeland. And then finally, we have what I call and what I refer to as a post-Atlantean period following the collapse of a Neo-Atlantean civilization, which may have been caused by a second cometary impact at the end of the Younger Trias, triggering the final sinking of Atlantis. There's, of course, some uncertainty as to um, the, the, the boundaries of Atlantean civilization, and up to when in time can we still talk about a genuine Atlantean tradition, but some of the evidence suggests that uh, the last remnants of uh, Atlantean civilization may well have influenced uh, the course of um, European civilization and civilization in Middle East and Africa well into the European Bronze Age and possibly as late as uh, 1200 BCE. Now, this is just a representation of uh, the first uh, Atlantean period that shows up uh, the uh, geological history and evolution of uh, Atlantis, uh, which certainly had its largest landmass uh, during the late tertiary and early quaternary period, and then following uh, the uh, gradual sinking and submersion of the mid-Atlantic ridge, uh, lost uh, various portions of land up to the point when uh, uh, Atlantis was in fact only reduced to a relatively small island uh, that coincided with uh, the Posidonis of Plato occupying uh, uh, roughly the region of the Azores Plateau in uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is, uh, again, the time of the first uh, Atlantean period when Atlantean civilization was still most an insular civilization that uh, developed on uh, uh, the island on the continent of Atlantis itself. During the second Atlantean period, after the first uh, cataclysm in uh, 35,000 uh, BCE, we see the emergence of uh, two different uh, blocks of power, two different traditions. One is uh, the Atlantean tradition with the birth of the second uh, Atlantean empire that uh, attempted to recover many of uh, the lands uh, belonging to uh, the original Atlantean Empire, also colonizing many new lands around uh, South America, North Africa, the Middle East, uh, as far as India. And then uh, the, um, the Aryan Empire here, as uh, uh, shown on this page, uh, represented by the nascent uh, Aryan civilization in Central Asia. There's also the suggestion that this division into the two uh, blocks of power actually reflected uh, the factions that arose on Atlantis itself uh, prior to the first Atlantean cataclysm. And so this distinction between, uh, to use the language of Edgar Cayce, uh, the uh, sons of Belial as representing uh, the most decadent and materialistic element of Atlantean civilization and the children of the low one that would represent, uh, would form the seed of the nascent Aryan humanity representing the most uh, spiritual component of Atlantis. Uh, Atlantean society. As we then move on into the Neo-Atlantean period, that's the time period immediately following uh, the uh, Younger Dryas Cataclysm and the cometary impact of 10,961 uh, BCE. It is at this time that two different centers of Neo-Atlantean power emerge in Egypt, a center on uh, Hieracompolis, and in South America, centered on uh, uh, Tepicala, and particularly on uh, the megalithic sites of Tiwanaku in Bolivia and Cusco in, uh, in Peru. These are two different centers of civilization would exert a very broad influence uh, uh, over large parts of South America, as well as uh, uh, Europe and uh, the Middle East up until 9600 BCE. This is when uh, a second cometary impact appears to have occurred, causing the final sinking and submersion of what was 
what's left of uh, the Atlantean mainland still uh, above water. It is also around this time that we witness a stop uh, in uh, megalithic construction around the world, uh, the Great Pyramid. Uh, construction stops at Giza and many of these other megalithic sites that remain unfinished would only be completed uh, thousands of years later uh, by uh, later peoples, by later civilizations, uh, not possessing the same level of sophistication and technological advancement. Um, finally, as we move into the post-Atlantean period, that's when things become uh, a bit more blurred. There is definitely evidence uh, that uh, uh, subsequent uh, uh, migrations from the Mid-Atlantic Ocean reached uh, the coast of Europe and North Africa throughout uh, much uh, of uh, the European Neolithic uh, uh, period and the early Bronze Age, uh, which uh, have come to be known as uh, the uh, megalithic uh, or sea people invasions. Uh, particularly when we look at uh, the diffusion and distribution of megalithic monuments in Northern and Western Europe, we can see uh, a clear pattern of uh, sites uh, that uh, start appearing uh, around uh, 4,000 800 BCE, always in the west, and then slowly spread towards the interior of France, Spain, the British Isles, as well as uh, the central Mediterranean region. Now, there's also evidence in the form of uh, megalithic architecture, as you can see, uh, for instance, on the right-hand side here of page, uh, this style of megalithic construction that ancient authors in Italy and Greece attributed to mythical Pelasgians, uh, by which they identified identified the Sea Peoples, uh, and uh, which appear in some cases to date back to uh, over 7,000 years ago. Some of these uh, megalithic structures have been dated uh, based uh, on uh, uh, different uh, the level reached by the sea in uh, prehistory and during the Bronze Age to 5,000 BCE, thus providing a uh, some important elements for the dating of uh, these uh, structures that may be connected with uh, uh, several waves of uh, uh, migrations from uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean into uh, Europe and uh, North Africa. Probably the latest in order of time of uh, these migrations is uh, the uh, famous uh, Sea People invasions of uh, the late Bronze Age of the 12th century BCE, when uh, we witness uh, a massive influx of uh, people from the uh, Western Mediterranean, quite possibly from regions as far as the European Atlantic seaboard into the Eastern Mediterranean, into Egypt uh, uh, as well, causing the collapse of barriers of the early Bronze Age states uh, in the region, including Mycenaean Greece, the Hittite Empire. There's also evidence of uh, significant geological instability at the time that may have been one of the triggers of these uh, sea people invasion, as well as the possibility of uh, some uh, additional uh, cosmic or cometary impact uh, at the end of the Bronze Age, which may have been responsible for some of the devastation witnessed across the Bronze Age sites uh, around both the Western and Eastern Mediterranean. Now, as we uh, move on into the final section of the presentation, we're going to talk about the legacy of uh, Atlantean uh, civilization. Uh, there is, uh, to begin with, uh, this idea that uh, uh, even though Atlantean civilization uh, uh, disappeared as a result of various uh, uh, cosmic and uh, terrestrial uh, cataclysm, some uh, elements of uh, uh, the science, uh, the knowledge and technology of Atlantis may have been been preserved at different sites and locations around the world. One of the uh, authors uh, that uh, um, certainly helped popularize this idea of uh, different repositories of antediluvian knowledge around the world was certainly Edward Casey in the 1920s and 1930s. He was the one who promoted the idea of uh, uh, at least the three major Atlantean holds of records meant to preserve the relics and the records of Atlantean civilization through the impending cataclysm. 
Casey actually speaks of three Atlantean holes of record. So one in Egypt, uh, on the Giza Plateau, another one on the uh, island of Posidoni, so Atlantis itself, and another one uh, in uh, uh, Yucatan or Central America. There were, however, certainly other secondary uh, holes of records, other secondary sites, where some uh, portions of the Atlantean records, where some archives were preserved, uh, which uh, then certainly played a very important role in the recovery and the reconstruction of civilization in the aftermath of uh, the uh, Younger Bryce cataclysm. It may be possible to some extent also to reconstruct the uh, chain of transmission of uh, Atlantean knowledge from uh, uh, the very remote period of following uh, the uh, fall and the destruction of Atlantis, uh, very much down uh, to the beginning of uh, the modern age. Uh, according to tradition, uh, the uh, originator of most or all of esoteric knowledge with the Egyptian god uh, uh, thought uh, that, uh, once again, is one of the uh, gods associated with uh, the Atlantean tradition and uh, with the arrival in Egypt of survivors from Atlantis. So this was later passed on into the teachings of Hellenistic Hermetism around the figure of Hermes Trismegistus. And then uh, uh, after the uh, fall of the Roman Empire and fall of the classical world, much of the legacy of uh, the Hermetic tradition was preserved in places like Haran in uh, southeastern Turkey, which was a seat of a very important university and uh, center of learning. Uh, after that, uh, some of this knowledge uh, may have been transferred to Constantinople. This is particularly after the destruction of Iran by uh, the Arabs first, and then by the Mongols. And then with the fall of uh, the Byzantine empires and the time of the Crusades, uh, it is quite possible that some of this knowledge may have been passed on first to the Cathars and then to the Knights Templars. And this is how this may have reached Europe during uh, the uh, 13th and 14th century, at the same time as we witness, for instance, since the birth uh, of Gothic architecture in Europe, uh, resurfacing of interest in uh, sacred geometry and many elements uh, of uh, the primordial tradition down to the time of uh, the famous Rosicrucian manifestos in the 1600s, seemed to portray a vision of uh, the renewal of the world, of a rebirth of uh, the primal tradition, which is uh, very much in line with uh, the teachings of uh, Hermetism uh, and of various of these uh, other esoteric and mystery schools of antiquity. Um, if we uh, just have a few uh, concluding remarks uh, here on this idea of a new renaissance, so why is this uh, uh, important uh, for the uh, people of today, for the mankind of today to go back uh, to the Atlantean past and learn more about uh, the teachings of Atlantis? Uh, part of the reason has to do with the fact that our own civilization seems to be going down very much the same path uh, as as uh, Atlantis, uh, which is a path of um, materialism, but also of scientific progress. Uh, um, which, uh, of course, comes with uh, very significant risks uh, for the survival of our own uh, civilization. There is also the possibility of uh, a rediscovery of uh, the legacy of the Atlantean past, uh, pretty much in the same way as the rediscovery of the legacy of the inheritance of Greece and Rome was what uh, ultimately uh, triggered a Renaissance period in Europe. The rediscovery of uh, the legacy of Atlantean science and technology it really has the potential of uh, triggering and opening up a new golden age uh, for, for mankind, uh, which as you, we see here also on uh, some of these quotes uh, uh, from various ancient texts uh, was effectively prophesied since, uh, since antiquity, this idea of a renewal of uh, the world, of a resurrection of uh, the Atlantean tradition, so that as uh, our own modern humanity is also fast approaching the end of the cycle, uh, with the beginning of uh, a new cycle, of a new uh, golden age, uh, we actually have also the uh, potential for restoring uh, much of uh, uh, what was lost at the time of uh, the fall of Atlantis and the last terrestrial cataclysm.
Just want to conclude uh, with uh, um, a few remarks uh, about uh, the ARCS project. Uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, this is an initiative which started uh, a few years ago with the objective of searching for some of the physical evidence of ancient advanced civilizations on our planet. Uh, uh, the ARCS project is now actively sponsoring and supporting uh, various uh, projects and research expeditions around the world, uh, aiming at uh, uncovering some of the records and legacy of Atlantean civilization. Uh, much of these projects are now focusing on uh, Mexico and Central America. They involve the use of uh, the latest technologies, such as um, ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity for the detection of underground uh, anomalies, as well as the mapping and documentation of ancient sites. They may yield uh, important uh, pieces of the puzzle of the origins of ancient civilization. So I invite you to also like follow and visit our webpage uh, www.arcsproject.org for more information on our projects and activities around the world. On these up, I will conclude uh, the presentation. Again, a, a reminder on uh, the book, uh, The Empires of Atlantis, uh, which is uh, available in all major bookstores throughout uh, the US uh, and uh, internationally. It's also available online on uh, Amazon uh, in Kindle format, uh, as well as, uh, as uh, an audio book. In the, in the book itself, uh, you will find a uh, many of uh, the same uh, uh, content that uh, I've discussed in this presentation, of course, in much greater detail. Um, the book itself is accompanied by a very extensive uh, uh, bibliography, so it can also be used as a source uh, and uh, reference book, uh, and also contains uh, dozens of illustrations, uh, many of which also appear in this presentation as well as color plates. So with this, I conclude this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I also invite you to follow me on my website, uh, www.marcovigato.com. Thank you very much for your attention.